So our next speaker uh, needs no introduction, um, but obviously has played an enormous role in uh, both discovery science and global health, and is going to talk to us about global equity and discovery science. So Ian Fraser, the president of our academy, welcome to the stage. Hmm. Okay, well, good morning once again. I, I'm a kind of practical guy, so there's not going to be much theory in this talk. And I'm going to talk a little bit about one area that I think I know a little bit about, which is cervical cancer, and tell you some of the lessons I've learned about uh, global equity in regards to that. So papillomaviruses cause cervical cancer 100%. Uh, for practical purposes, if there were no papillomaviruses, there would be no cervical cancer. So it should, in principle, be a preventable disease. Globally, cervical cancer kills a quarter of a million women worldwide every year. And as you can see from the map there, the countries in dark red are the countries with the highest mortality from cervical cancer. Pale pink, as Australia is, countries with low mortality. So this is a disease largely of the developing world. Uh, Treating papillomavirus infections once they're there is a challenge. Uh, this gentleman had uh, a suggestion as to how you might get rid of a papillomavirus related problem. Uh, rather concerningly, 560 people on Facebook actually recommend this as an approach. Uh, and, but in practice, what is, he's recommending is not so far from the truth because what we actually do for papillomavirus infections that are likely to cause cancer is to destroy them physically. I mean, we do that with surgery and it's a little more elegant than a shotgun, but it's not really the best option. Preventing the infection would seem to be a much more sensible idea. Uh, so Harold Zerhausen made that possible with the discovery back in 1980 that papillomaviruses were responsible for at least some cervical cancer. And I think we now accept that they're responsible for all of them. He recognized two types of papillomavirus, type 16 and 18, that were together responsible for about 70% of cervical cancer, an important figure to remember later. But we now recognize that by adding another eight or nine types, and 100% of cervical cancer can be accounted for. My colleague, Jan Zhu, and I came up with a potential vaccine for cervical cancer back in 1990 by finding a way of making these things called virus-like particles, which are basically the shell of the virus made by using recombinant DNA technology in the lab. That was necessary because you can't grow this virus in the lab and therefore the conventional means of developing vaccines are not available for cervical cancer because the technologies don't work. So papillomavirus virus-like particles have become the basis of vaccines which are now available on a global basis. And uh, Cervix and Gardasil are both based on that technology. We now have Gardasil 9 which will cover most of the papillomavirus types. We invested about $0.1 million in coming up with that technology back in 1990. It was basically one part of a year's work for two of us uh, and not much in the way of resources. Of course, the companies have spent $2 billion in getting these vaccines out to the market. And that presents a problem because they have to get that $2 billion back. Uh, the trials that had, the reason we needed $2 billion was largely because papillomavirus induced cervical cancer is a rare consequence of infection of all the people that get HPV infection, which is essentially everybody in this room, and I'm casting no aspersions about what you get up to, but it's a sexually transmitted disease, which we all get. 50% uh, at least of uh, young college women have the disease, the virus, when they leave college. So you need very large groups of people to take part in trials because only 1% of those infections will go on to cause a cancer. And so the studies had to be done looking for prevention of pre-cancer, uh, cervical and epithelial neoplasia, and those studies involved tens of thousands of women taking part. They demonstrated effectively that the vaccine could control and prevent cervical and epithelial neoplasia with two uh, conditions on that. First of all, it only worked if you had not already acquired the infection. If you had already acquired the infection, there was no reduction in risk whatsoever, and the virus vaccines only worked against the types of virus that were there. So just to take that into practical results from Australia, and this is Julia Bretton's work uh, as a sort of collective looking at what's happened in Australia since papillomavirus vaccines were introduced in 2007, and looking at the, what we're going to look at 
is the reduction in frequency with which abnormal pap smears are found according to the age at which people were vaccinated. So if you look at people who were immunized before the age of 14, then there's been about a 70% reduction in infection and in pre-cancer in that group, which is what you'd expect because the vaccine that was used back then protected against the two virus types that are responsible for 70% of cancer. So that basically says for what we were expecting it was effectively 100% efficient. But if you look at the, what happened for people who were 17 when they were vaccinated, when they had already been sexually active, very much less protection was seen. So this is a, vac a vaccine which only works if you give it early and get there before the virus does, because once the virus has got there you're not going to do anything useful with the vaccine. So that's the take home message from the theoretical point of view. The practical problem is that there is a huge discrepancy at the moment between where the vaccine is being delivered and where the cervical cancer is. The countries in green on the map are the countries that have at least embarked on some sort of universal vaccination program against cervical cancer. The purple blobs on that map are where all the cervical cancer is. And it doesn't really overlap, does it? So there's a challenge there to overcome. We started back in 2008 thinking about was it possible to deliver vaccine programs effectively in countries uh, where there are limited resources. It's not simple because it's a vaccine that has to be given to teenagers before they become sexually active, but you don't want to give it in part of the routine vaccination program to two to four year olds because first of all, a long time before any pr protective result will be seen. Secondly, we don't know how long the protection lasts after we give the vaccine. We now know it's at least 10 years, but we don't yet have data to say it will last a lifetime. So we went to Vanuatu because first of all, they asked us to come there. And secondly, because one of my colleagues Margaret McAdam is a GP who does some work in Vanuatu helping with women's health issues. The problem in Vanuatu, that as we found when we went screening there, was that about 5% of healthy 30-year-old Nivanu women had pre-malignancy in their cervix already walking the streets when we went looking, and 1% were actually walking around with cervical cancer. And there is no treatment for cervical cancer practically in Vanuatu. So it seemed logical to see if we could get a vaccine program to work there. We started with the hypothesis that it would be difficult to get girls to come back for three visits to get three separate vaccines as was then prescribed for the vaccine. And we wanted to test a hypothesis that we could encourage them to come back. So we actually organized the randomized by cluster trial where we actually did village by village either no incentive to come back or gave them a little colored bracelet with no, no message on it or a little colored message bracelet with a message saying come back and get your vaccine in three months time. Uh, in fact as it turned out and I'll show you in a moment that part of the study was a waste of time because they all came back uh, <laughs> regardless. Uh, well, that wasn't what I intended to do. Uh, Vanuatu there's some challenges, 50 islands for a quarter of a million people, uh, 25 doctors, 91 parliamentarians, a bad ratio of that, <laughs> do not encourage that in this country. Uh, just one vaccine fridge uh, that actually is uh, in the old French uh, hospital in Vanuatu which is totally destroyed by an earthquake apart from where the vaccine fridge is and no reliable electricity supply to the fridge. So it's not all that easy to deliver vaccine there but we did manage to introduce a program which although I'm shown in the picture there as given the vaccine was delivered in fact by the Nivanu uh, district nurses themselves. It's a very standard vaccine picture there, you know, the girl who looks really uncomfortable because she's just had the vaccine, the girl who looks really worried because she's no, she knows she's going to get it, and the one smiling in the background because she's already had it. Uh, so, uh, but in fact they actually were all very accepting of the vaccine, much more, much more so than in Australia, I might add. Uh, the critical thing, of course, with any program that you want to introduce in public health is to get the education working. And we went out there and educated parents, children, staff at the schools and government officials in a collective effort over the course of the island before we introduced the program. And as you can see from the data, what we found was that in comparison with Australia, we got just as good vaccine coverage in Vanuatu, given that you'd given them the vaccine. You know, in other words, we supplied the vaccine free of charge to them. All they needed to do was to do work out and deliver a program, which they actually did. And they've continued to do intermittently, although there have been nine changes of government since 2008 in Vanuatu. And every time there's a change of government, there's a change of health minister, a change of secretary for health. And the net result is the vaccine program disappears for at least six to nine months before they start thinking about doing it again. So it's not all that easy, but you can do it in principle.
We also went to Bhutan, and this is the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation when I say we, because I was at that time on their board. Bhutan is a small country which, like, Niva like Vanuatu, has a very limited income. It's down at the bottom end of the uh, GDP scale, less than $100 US per year per person. Cervical cancer, as you can see at the top of the picture there, is the most common cancer amongst women in, in Bhutan. And it's a young population that has that in common with, with uh, Vanuatu. It also has in common with Vatu, Vanuatu. The, these are the two countries in the world where they claim that they have the highest happiness index of any countries. That's probably because they are uh, not that wealthy and therefore don't complain much about what they don't have. But it is interesting that those two countries both meet that description. Anyway, we went to Vanuatu and we went to Bhutan and the two countries were very different because Vanuatu, we had to talk with the government to get them to do things. Uh, Bhutan, the royal grandmother, who's the young woman in the middle there between my wife and myself, uh, she decided that her country should be vaccinated. It was, in her opinion, essential that because a vaccine was now available, the the children of, Aunt, of Bhutan should be protected. So she just basically instructed the two gentlemen in the Saffron Roads there, that's the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education, that they were to deliver a vaccine program, period. And that's what they did. And the first year that they did it, they went out into the schools and they estimated there were about 6,700 girls who were eligible to be vaccinated and they got them all, which you know, you can argue they maybe they did that the other way around. We vaccinated 6,700 people, so that was the total population. But that's not the purpose of this slide. The purpose of this slide is to show that when they then decided that they could save a little bit of resources by delivering the vaccine program through health centres rather than through schools, immediately the uptake of the vaccine dropped and stayed dropped for the three years that they did that. And only when they went back into the schools in 2014 were they able then to show that they could get near nearly 100% of the population. This despite the royal grandmother saying we've got to do this and money and vaccine being made available for that to happen. Of course, the reason for that is simple. The health centres were usually two to three hours walk away from where the girls lived. And it was a big exercise for them to go and get the vaccine. But in principle, it showed once again that in a low resource country, given vaccine and a will to get a vaccine out there, there is no block to vaccine delivery. So, Ten years into the vaccine program, how are we doing globally in controlling cervical cancer through immunization? Now, this is theoretical to some extent, it's calculated results, and I can't take any credit for this because it was a composite effort at the, at the most recent International Papillomavirus Conference. We know that over 200 million doses of vaccine have been deliver, delivered on a global basis. So that's the you know, denominator, if you like. We also know that there are 25 million women alive today who will die of an HPV-induced cancer if we don't block the chain of infection. And these are the people who are already infected or who will be infected in countries where the virus is circulating, and they are the 1% of the total population over the next uh, lifespan, if you like, who are going to die of cervical cancer. Theoretically, if, we've del if we're delivering vaccine to 200 million women worldwide, we would expect 2 million lives to be saved. One in 100 people will get cervical cancer and they will die. So that's the little blue box down at the bottom. But what actually is happening is that out of all those vaccines, we've probably prevented about 10,000 deaths. Now, the reason for that is very simple. The vast majority of vaccines are being delivered in countries where there are already cervical cancer screening programs, treatment for the disease, and therefore the women are not really at risk. I mean, you can argue about whether they are at risk or not, but screening programs work and cervical cancer in this country is just not heard of amongst women who are taking part in the screening program. So we have a big challenge to face up to. We really have to work out how we're going to get that vaccine where it's needed in the developing world. So can we do better as a program for delivering vaccine than three doses of an expensive vaccine? Well, we can't reduce the cost of the vaccine. We have, the, the world at large has tried to produce cheaper vaccines. Admittedly, we pay a high price for them in this country, but in the developing world, the, the vaccines are available essentially at cost. The, the vaccine the companies, Merck and GSK, make these vaccines available to the developing world through various programs at cost. So can we reduce the number of doses of vaccine we give? Well, we don't have any good randomized data. There was a trial to be done in India 
uh, the trial was stopped by the Indian government halfway through as a result of some political shenanigans which related to the deaths of young women from suicide in one particular province in India, in Uttar Pradesh, being attributed to the vaccine rather than other causes. But the net result is that that one study that might have answered this question scientifically will now not be done. But what we do know is what degree of protection was given by the vaccine in the randomized controlled trials to people who did not get all three doses. So it's a little artificial and the numbers are quite small as you can see. There are only 292 uh, young girls only got one dose. Uh, but looking at the protection that was actually achieved with that, you can see that the difference between one dose and three doses in terms of prevention of infection over a five-year period, and I stress infection, not cervical precancer, and a five-year period, was essentially 100% for both groups. So that's interesting because that says we can treat this as an, as an epidemic of infection disease rather than an endemic infectious disease and go out and immunize in the same way as you might do for an epidemic of Zika virus or Ebola virus and just immunize the entire population, break the transmission chain and then see what happens. So, oh, sorry. so the question really is, can we devise a program which will actually work in the developing world and is easier to deliver than three doses of vaccine to teenagers. And the questions therefore are really what age to immunize and I think that we're stuck with school-based programs because they work and therefore we're going to immunize school girls that the last year they go to school in any particular country in Vanuatu that happens to be nine or ten for the vast majority of the population. In Bhutan it's fourteen so there's a, there's a choice there. How many doses? Well I would argue that if we're really going to get control of cervical cancer in the developing world it should be one dose and we should treat it as an, ep as an end epidemic disease and immunize everybody from the age of eight to forty. Just get the chain of infection broken. 16 and 18 enough? Yeah, well, I haven't answered that question in detail, but the short answer is it probably is to make a, a really good impact, and this, it, the two-valent vaccine is the cheapest one at the moment. Girls only or boys as well? I haven't shown you data on that, but we showed in Australia quite clearly between 2006 and 2012 that if you immunized the girls alone and even only got 70% of the girls immunized, that was still enough to get a 90% reduction in infection in the community over those six years. So I would argue that you probably only need to immunize once one girl, one sex at least, girls or boys, either way around, should break the train of transmission. It's better to immunize girls because they are more aware of the connection with cervical cancer than boys are of the risk of other cancers. But there are of course good social arguments why you might want to do both groups because any vaccine that you give to one sex, everybody assumes there's a reason for it and the reasons are usually not assumed to be good. So given the efficiency of herd immunity, a single dose mass immunization program would probably be the most effective and cost effective to get rid of the problem worldwide. So just to finish off, I would like to compare HPV and cervical cancer with the case for polio vaccination worldwide. Polio and, and uh, HPV share a lifetime risk of catching the infection in a pre-vaccine era of about 50%. Epidemics of polio virus did not produce disease in everybody, just as they don't in cervical cancer. And only 1% of people that get polio virus actually end up with a, with a paralytic polio. 2% of women who get cer cer HPV end up with cervical precancer. Lifetime risk of death, 0.1% given infection for polio, 0.8% given infection for women with cervical cancer. Interestingly, if you go back to the last year before the epidemics of polio stopped, which is 1952 in the United States, in that year, 3,100 women and uh, people died of polio and 21,000 people got par paralysis. In 2005, which is the last year before vaccination became available for HPV in the United States, 3,900 women died of cervical cancer. And remember, this isn't a country where they screen for cervical cancer and have been doing so for 30 years. And nevertheless, 3,900 women died because they don't take part in the screening program, particularly the disadvantaged women. And the 12,000 women were diagnosed with cervical cancer. So I would argue that, that if there's a case for eliminating polio virus on the planet, there should be an equally good case for eliminating cervical cancer through prevention of HPV infection.
The efficiencies of the vaccine are equally good. In fact, if anything, the HPV is somewhat better than polio. And the safety of the vaccine, again, for HPV is somewhat better than polio. A uh, polio vaccine, the live one, occasionally induces paralytic polio. The only known problems with the HPV vaccine are a case, a very scarce cases of severe allergy to the vaccine. And they occur immediately and are manageable on the spot. So I'd leave you with the concept that we should really be pushing for a universal program to immunize against HPV infection in the same way as we're doing for polio. And on that note, I'll stop and acknowledge that this work is done by a fairly large number of people, including my, my, my own lab team, which I show which they are largely to show how ethnically diverse they are. And if they, uh, you can see that there's not an Australian amongst them. Uh, and uh, also that this has been funded by a very wide range of people, and particularly in Vanuatu by Tusker Breweries, by the way, who provided the cold chain and the dry ice and various <laughs> other very useful things, because of course you need a lot of CO2 to make beer. Thank you very much for your attention. We've just got time for a couple of questions. One, just thanks. John. John. I didn't know your voice was so loud. <laughs> <laughs> can't I imagine you being proper. <laughs> no, I I'm just pretending to be proper. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, actually, just a couple of comments. One is that I think that the what you've really illustrated well is is the how a vaccine can um, overcome. Uh, in inequalities in health that are due to other factors. So you've alluded to it, but the, in Australia, the reason Aboriginal women have much higher rates of survival cancer incidence and mortality is because poor access to screening. And that's really been eliminated essentially by the vaccine. And, and the data that we have now shows that, that coverage rates for Aboriginal people are generally as, almost as good as non-Aboriginal, even in remote communities. And also that, that survival uh, pre-cancer and, uh, and um, um, infection rates are, are have been reduced equally in Aboriginal people. So we've sort of jumped over the, the gap in, in cervical cancer screening. But the big problem, as you've alluded to, is how to get these, these programs internationally. And I think what it raises the question that, that the, all the research has been done in rich countries, and we've had this obsession with getting the, getting the very, very best um, coverage or the very best efficacy out of our programs, and really focusing on you know what, what is the perfect way to do this this vaccin the vaccination in rich countries, and we're then not prepared to face up to the idea of what you propose, which is a sort of a, a sort of a slightly reduced efficacy, but much more likely to reach a big population. So how do we sort of overcome that fact that all the research done in the rich countries, but the policies needed in the poor countries? Yeah, I think that. We, as usual, need to turn to research to answer the question. And I mean, I've been talking in Vietnam with the Vietnam Health Ministry there about cluster randomizing to one versus two doses of vaccine in communities there. They get enthusiastic and then unenthusiastic again about the study. The logistics are quite hard there. But unless we actually get a definitive answer to that question, we'll never really be comfortable with the idea of treating this as an epidemic and getting it controlled under a simple regime of immunizing everybody once doing mass immunization programs. I think we have to try it. And I think it's really important to accept that this is a vaccine for the developing world. Yes, it's great to have it in Australia. It's a sort of belt and braces approach with a good screening program, which is not going to stop because we've got a vaccine program, at least not for a generation or so. But uh, for the developing world, we need something that we can do here and now. And it is a bit distressing that 10 years into the program, we still have not really got anything like the sort of penetration that we need to make a shift in that 250,000 cases a year of cervical cancer death, which as far as I'm concerned are avoidable deaths. Okay, I think, thanks very much Ian, and can I thank you so much for taking your very, um, your preventive med medical work and putting that equity lens across it. I thought that was fantastic, so thank you very much. Thank you.